here with uh, Jamie Myers, the Head of Strength and Conditioning here at the US Olympic Training Center. Jamie, welcome to Spose Talk. Thank you very much. So, Jamie, your, your role here is dealing with lots of sports, one of which is track and field program. What are the other sports that you're working um, with here? Primarily it is track and field. I do a little bit of work with um, BMX and then uh, just kind of chime in with other groups, uh, mostly with the other strength coaches here. A lot of them are former interns of mine, so uh, I kind of help out with that. And then, uh, so primarily track and field, then a little bit of BMX, and uh, that's about it, so it's not a bad gig for me. <laughs> Within the track and field, you have uh, largely here, they've got throwers, good group of jumpers, mm -hmm. um, the big Paralympic contingent here as yes. well. They're, they're primarily the athletes that use this facility. Yes, that is correct. Um, we do have uh, other athletes come through. We have uh, men's and women's rowing uh, comes through every year for a couple months, and then um, occasionally just other groups. Uh, we've got a sailing group out here right now. So kind of anybody who's a Olympic sport that's supported by the USOC. Um, all the NGBs are welcome to come out for camps, but the, the main use is uh, track and field, then uh, rugby uses it quite a bit here. They're also resident athletes, men's and women's sevens, and, um, and then I'd say the other primary user actually is rowing. So. And in terms of the athletes that are here, particularly the track and field athletes, how do you work with the coaches that they work with? How does how um, your interaction work? Whatever the coach wants out of me, right? So uh, sometimes it's as simple as just, this is the program I want them to do. You keep an eye on them, make sure they don't hurt themselves, and as much as uh, do your thing. So just kind of everywhere in between. It's a little bit of everything. But I've seen you over the years here, and there's a lot of uh, the throws particularly that you've had a lot of input into. Yeah, um, I've been fortunate to just get along well with them uh, for whatever reason, and uh, so I've, they've welcomed my input more and more, it seems, each year. So. And, and in dealing with throwers, what's the, the basis of your philosophy, or what have you developed in, in terms of your philosophy? Um, I, I would say it kind of depends, and one of the things that I've been fortunate is I get to see throwers that are outstanding from all over the world. And I try to just observe what they all do that's the same instead of what they all do that's different and use that as the basis of my philosophy. So uh, all the different things that work, the one thing that's the same is they're all really good throwers, right? So from my role, I try to look at the weight workouts that I write for athletes from a standpoint of I don't want to get in the way of acquiring skill or perfecting skill, right? So however that ends up looking, depending on what the coach wants or whatever, I tend to be very conservative both with uh, load and volume because I, I just want them to be able to have really high quality practice and acquire their skill and I don't want the weight room to get in the way of that, whether it's from a nervous system standpoint or just being so sore that you can't hold the positions that you want to be in. And I notice with you, you actually spend a lot of time out on the field observing the athletes in their, in their environment. Yes, yeah. yeah. I feel that that uh, is super important because it helps me understand the load that they're experiencing on a daily basis outside of the weight room. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to spend most mornings uh, down at the track either with the throwers or with the jumpers and I just try to observe and learn as much as I can from the coaches and from the athletes and um, yeah it's just it's kind of something that you don't really think about traditionally as you know strength and conditioning right it's a uh, we get into it because we like lifting weights and so our background typically tends to be weightlifting and powerlifting and oftentimes our the workouts we write for athletes reflect that as do the volumes and the intensities and that's not always appropriate for an athlete who's spending three hours throwing or you know two hours warming up sprinting and jumping so it's just it's inappropriate I feel and um, so I try to spend time at practice to <laughs> remind myself of that as, <laughs> as often as possible. <laughs> you also get athletes that come in here at a pretty good level. Correct. They come in maybe out of college, but they've achieved usually a, a, an IFFA standard mm -hmm. or B standard in yep. order to gain access to this center. Yes. Um, so but pre presumably they come in with a pretty good strength base, perhaps? Most of the time. There, there's always you know exceptions to the rule, but... Uh, I personally feel that most of the kids that we get through here, their, their physical capacity is not the issue, right? That's not why they haven't made a team or won a medal. It's uh, usually something technical, which again goes back to why I try to be real conservative. Um, some of them, the coach might want them to get stronger and that, that's fine, but it shouldn't be at the expense of the sport practice, right? It should be an assistance role for that. And, and you know, you, you 
also look at strength and power. I know from talking to you mm -hmm. that that's a big factor as well. You're not over concerned with just strength. Correct. You're looking across the board at other things that help. Right. What do you do when you assess someone when they come in here? What? How do you think this is what they need to do? And um, there's not a, a real formal assessment process. Uh, the, our sports medicine group does like uh, kind of just the general physical FMS type thing to give me an idea of uh, what orthopedic issues they might have. And then from there, usually we get them in the fall, so it's often for most of the kids base training stuff anyway. And um, I just try to observe, right? And uh, give them just kind of base training. We start off with, you know, your general kind of hypertrophy stuff usually. And from there, I kind of see where they're at and get a feel for how they move weight. Are they like a grinding athlete or are they pretty snappy? And uh, kind of go from there, to be honest. So it's, it's not a, a very formal process. It's uh, I'm sure plenty of strength coaches wouldn't be happy with it because it's just kind of like intuitive and I watch them and I communicate with them and I see what the coach wants and where the coach thinks they're at too. And you know, does the coach think that they need more maximum strength or their maximum strength is okay and they just need to move stuff quicker or is it kind of somewhere in between or am I given free reign? If I'm given free reign, I tend to not go the maximum strength route as much right. as I do the, uh, the speed strength and power yeah. route. And you've also, as you mentioned here, you've got to observe a lot of internationally, uh, international athletes that come right. in here. What's the biggest thing that uh, you've learned from them in terms of the approach that they make that perhaps is different from the traditional American-based system, college system? Right. I, I would say it, probably it was from uh, Derek and Dr. B. Um, and just like Derek explaining to me Dr. B's system. Um, which was hard for me to understand, but once I kind of wrapped my head around the idea that training is training, right? And um, strength coaches, we say that all the time, oh, the weight room's just GPP, but if you look at the, a lot of the weight workouts, that's not reflected as such. Um, and so like to, to actually think about it from, it's all training. For me, that was like a big light bulb moment to think like it, the weight room is not a separate entity. It is just a part of everything that's happening. Um, as I talk to other strength coaches, one of the analogies, it's an extreme one, but I've been trying to like use an extreme one to get people to think and I say, for a discus thrower, doing a power clean is the same as a power lifter doing dumbbell flies after their bench press workout. Obviously it's not, but from like a structure of a workout and training, it falls in the same kind of category, right? So who in their right mind is going to max out on dumbbell flies all the time? Yeah. So, you know, just kind of thinking about it like that and how important is it? How much emphasis are you going to place on it? How much energy are you going to put into it? As we, you know, energy being a finite resource, we can't just load people, and load people, and load people. You go throw hard for a couple hours and all right, let's do the Bulgarian method for our weightlifting. Like, I, it's just crazy. Yeah. So. And Dr. Bundachuk was here with uh, a number of athletes. Yeah, he's come years. out a lot. Um, it's been interesting, you mentioned it, observing him. It is a different approach. It's kind of flavor of the month, we might say. Sure. There's a lot of discussion about the Bondachuk method and, mm -hmm. and perhaps not too many people really understand it very well. You had the opportunity to speak with Derek Everly, who, yeah. who understands it uh, probably as well as anyone uh, right. and spent some time with him. Um, and did you get the chance to talk to Bondachuk as well? I, I've, I've spoken with Dr. B quite a bit. I've had a hard time understanding him all the time, to be quite honest. And uh, when I come away from a conversation with Dr. B, I don't really ask many questions because it takes me a long time to digest everything. Um, part of the, the language barrier and how he uses the English language um, just requires me to think about it a lot. Yeah. So I haven't had the chance uh, to ask him a lot of questions, but uh, <laughs> a lot of times when I have a question, I'll contact Derek and <laughs> he'll kind of help explain to the best of his understanding what Dr. B was trying to tell me. Um, but uh, yeah, it just and I kind of, within Dr. B's system, I'm just trying to look at it from a big picture standpoint because I'm not a throws coach and I don't pretend to be, and I'm just trying to understand kind of like the questions he asks basically and then how he arrives at the answers he arrives at. And then um, I might ask the same question and arrive at a different answer, but if I'm taking a similar approach, you know, and like training's just training, and if I'm asking some of those same questions, what's actually going to make someone better? Is it, you know, taking your bench press from 220 kilos to 280 kilos? That's nonsense, right? So, 
you know, just looking at that transfer of training, the amount of energy, not that you don't do things that have a quote unquote low transfer, but how much energy do you put into them, right? But I think it's also good when you get to read some of Dr. Bondichuk or some of the other articles on there about mm -hmm. the system to actually observe him in action. Right. You can then see, well, what are the actual important parts? Yeah. Like, what's, the, what's the real stuff there? <laughs> right. what, what's on? true and what's not, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's, uh, you see him, what he does for, let's say, a week. He's out at your facility and then uh, what, that's what he did that week, yeah. right? Or what you happen to observe, but that's not necessarily what he does when, oh, I watched Bonder truck train, or I watched, you know, the Germans train or the Polish train. And it's like, you see a snippet of what they do. So uh, when I watch it, I just try to look at like, kind of themes, you know, and like behaviors and everything. And sometimes the coaches are willing to discuss their training and other times they aren't. That's fine, I just try to observe. And, grab what I can and steal it all. <laughs> and, and as part of the USOC system, you get to see a lot of the research that's been going, going on and also the cutting edge research and, and some of the technology that's out there. What's the technology that you've seen that you feel has been valuable to you and you, you tend to use on a, on a daily basis almost? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the technology that we use the most, at least for me, is um, the, the bar velocity, like Tendo units and Gym Aware's playing with the push band a little bit. Um, for me, I, I view like it's kind of that old training is testing, testing is training, right? I, I agree with that. I like that philosophy. So I like the, the tendos and things like that because it's just a simple thing. It doesn't get in the way of training and it gives us an objective, another objective measurement outside of just putting load on the bar, which I kind of am trying to get away from with our throwers certainly because in my experience sometimes that gets pursued to a detriment. And then with our jumpers, they don't really want to put a lot of weight on the bar. And so if I put the tendo on the bar, they like, oh, it went faster, right? So speed it makes them happy. They work harder. Everybody's happy. I don't care how heavy they go, but they're not sandbagging it, right? So uh, yeah, that, that's really all I use personally. Um, we have some sports technologists here, and they'll do some force plate stuff. We've got force plates in the runway um, for one of the long jump pits here. And um, we've got the TrackMan system that we use a lot. So uh, all that stuff's really neat. But from a day-to-day -day basis, the stuff that I use is pretty much just the things that tell me how fast the bar is moving and give me a power output reading. And that's the, really the important thing, is you need to have some kind of technology that helps you in your right. day-to-day -day basis on what you want to do. Yeah. And if right. the key thing for you is bar speed, then that's great having something simple mm -hmm. that works in all yep. scenarios. Just gives me a little bit more information so I can make a more informed decision about you know, should we go up, should we not go up, how hard was that really, instead of like, oh, it felt pretty good. There's been a lot of athletes here that have had some incredible numbers in the way. Um, uh, and some of them trained very hard to get those numbers. Yes. And as you mentioned, sometimes perhaps to their detriment yep. in terms of their throwing. But uh, um, who, who are the athletes that you've admired and, and been impressed with when they've come in here and worked here for a while? Oh, I mean, it's, there's so many. Um, you know, all, all of them kind of for different reasons and from different things. You know, I, I feel super fortunate to be able to be here and work with, you know, Kara Winger, formerly Kara Patterson, Russ Winger, Jared Rome, Ian Waltz, Mike Hazel, um, Sean Fury, like it just, you know, for where we're at in U.S. throwing, it's all the best U.S. throwers, and so I, I just have tried to learn so much from them. I mean, right now Joe Kovacs is here, and everybody knows how Joe's doing. It's ridiculous, and, um, you know, just kind of, they all have a little bit different approach, and I try to learn something from all the athletes, and one of the things I learned, and it was reinforced by some of the stuff I've talked with Vestin about, is the different psychology of each kid, right? And, you know, we just talked about maybe they're lifting a little too heavy, but they like to lift heavy. And who am I to tell them not to do that, you know? And uh, if, it, if me taking away a heavy load impairs their confidence, right. it's probably more of a detriment than letting them lift heavy. Yeah. So. It's an interesting one. You, you mentioned Joe there as a as kind of flavor of the month right now. Mm. He's, he's obviously lighting the throat's world on fire. Yes. Um, when I spoke to Art about Joe, he said one of the differences between he and, for example, John Godina and John Brennan, the other 22 meter guys that Art's yeah. had under his tutelage, is that, Art, uh, is that Joe likes the weight room a little more, that he buys into the need to have just more strength. 
Yeah. And uh, and he's pretty impressive. He is quite it. impressive. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So he's, uh, he's he, he likes to work and he likes to work hard, but he's he's still got that tremendous speed about him in the in, in the work that he does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, he's a freak of nature. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Um, I don't feel like we do anything special to um, try to develop the speed as opposed to the strength, for instance. Um, one of the things I think that kind of makes Joe special is uh, he can do some of these really impressive numbers that he has in the weight room without having to like get super psyched up and yell and scream and sniff ammonia caps and dig real deep and you know essentially waste all that emotional energy that drains you a lot more than you might think the lift would if you could stay calm and do it and so joe has a really good ability i think to stay pretty calm and still hit just some massive numbers in the weight room um, which i think uh, is part of what allows him to not get super jacked up yeah. by hitting those big numbers yeah, yeah. you know so he, he does stay very calm and i think also you know the, the, there's a lot of discussion and talk about some big marks that he's, he's hit in warm-ups and, and mm -hmm. competitions, but it hasn't let that phase him. He's still mm -hmm. pretty straightforward yeah. and down to earth, and he just wants to get on and work, and, and yep. he sees the bigger picture about later on in the year, so this is just early in the season. Absolutely. And, you know, that's uh, carry through in the weight room as well. Yep, yeah, he, uh, he trusts art implicitly, yeah. so it's good. Yeah, that's, I uh, think that's uh, really important for athletes to, to do, is you just have to trust your coaches, you know, and. Um, I try to take my lead from Art, but if you know Art's not here and Joe's in the weight room, and I'm like Joe, you gotta stop. Joe trusts me enough to shut her down, and you know, so he's uh, he's very good at that. Very good at like just being super trusting, and I think that's part of his strength and part of why he's not getting, you know, kind of caught up in being flavor of the month or whatever we want to call it. He just doesn't really think about that stuff, you know. He's more interested in eating a meat sandwich. So. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of thinking of the future and stuff like that, is there anything that you think, oh, I wish I had this kind of technology or that, what would be useful for you if you had a wish list, um, you know, that, that would, that you think could help you to, to deliver, you know, better athletes um, in the weight room and, and strength and conditioning rather than um, the weight room? I don't know if it's technology so much as it is perhaps just the athletes understanding the role of the weight room, right? Um, whether they like it or not, understanding the role of it. So some of them think it's completely unnecessary, and some of them think it's the only thing that will let them achieve success. Um, and I think if they would uh, meet somewhere in the middle and kind of understand that it's just part of training and it can take a bigger part depending on the system or a smaller part, but not to get caught up in chasing numbers to in the weight room to um, lead to greater performance outside of the weight room because yes when you're horribly weak and very young chasing numbers in the weight room helps because you're just you're horribly weak but after a certain point it's not going to help i don't think there's anything wrong with you know kind of taking the approach of we're not going to pursue strength but if we get stronger well great because then you're not beating anybody up and you're not taking away from what we're trying to be good at. Yeah. So it's, it's as strong as you need to be, not as strong as you can be. Exactly. And even though, you know, look, we're around some pretty exceptional guys and without question they're strong. Yes. They may not set out to be as strong as they could be. Correct. And so a Joe Kovacs just happens to be a very strong guy. Right. <laughs> and he's not caught up in trying to push that yet to the max. He's, he's you know, he, he knows he's got time. He's still yeah. pretty young on that. Yep. And I think that's uh, Yeah, I think if, if more people would just kind of come in and train, right, and use it for, you know, it, it can be a major uh, stimulus if need be, but it could also, depending on how you're training, just be tissue work to help prevent injuries. And, um, you know, I think it just, I'm not really sold one way or the other as far as what it should be, because I think it depends on everything else that's happening. It's not, I'm not, you know, a guy who's like, oh, you got to... You got to follow this protocol in the weight room or else nothing's going to work. I think it uh, completely depends on everything else that they're doing because like I said, if it falls into the category in my mind of a dumbbell fly, there's so many ways to go about that. I know. often find coaches will send people in the weight room because it's easy sure and it's easy to get improved numbers but they don't often translate into improved throws mm -hmm. at the end of the day we're throwers we want to use the weight room right. to help us be throwers yep. and not to be better in the weight room absolutely yeah, yeah. and that's uh if somehow that could get um communicated when they're younger i think that might help um 
you know, and then if they like it, great, and they want to continue to lift weights and lift heavy, that, that's, I'm not trying to discourage that or anything, but at the same time to just understand the role of it, and if, if you happen to be trying to hit something heavy and you miss a weight, that's one of the things I've noticed about uh, Tomas, the Majewski, right? I've seen him, he missed, uh, it was before London games, he missed 180 kilo clean, could not have cared less yeah. that he missed it. Yeah. Just those, bleh, yeah. like, right? He still did the effort. He still yeah. got the benefit from right. it, even though yep. he actually didn't catch it. Didn't no, affect didn't. his training in uh, the least bit. Keep He's a two-time gold medalist, so. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Jamie, thank you very much. You've been very enlightening. Appreciate your uh, your time being put in here and also your insight into what's going on here at the well, Training Center. I really appreciate it. I don't feel like I deserve to be interviewed by you from all, the, all these like giants of throwing that you've interviewed, so I'm, I'm humbled by this. Thank you. Welcome. Cheers. Thank you.